Good morning, everybody. If uh, would the board would take their seats, please. We'll get started here, try to get started on time. Just a reminder, on our agenda, first item of this morning will be uh, moving to an executive session. So I would ask the uh, those seated uh, not in the board chair just to be prepared to pick up and move temporarily for just a short period as we open the executive session. So I uh, appreciate it if the board would take their seats. There's always got to be one in the crowd. <laughs> Oh, Sharon Thompson. Very good. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. It uh, called meeting to order. Uh, today is, uh, for the record, December 12th. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. We've got a couple important items today, uh, three action items for consideration by the board. Um, I will say that we do have a quorum this morning. Uh, we'll start quickly with introductions. Um, I'm Norm Steinteller, County Commissioner, currently serving as your chair. Let's move this way. Mayor? Great. Thank you. Neil Levy, Mayor of Woodland Park. Tyler Stevens, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Green Mountain Falls. Go ahead. Yolanda Avila, Colorado Springs City Council. And Pico, Colorado Springs City Council. Jill Gabler, Colorado Springs City Council. Don Wilson, Town of Monument, Mayor. All we together. Got, we got a block <laughs> Ken Jure, Mayor of Manitou Springs. Rob Bearden, Vice Commander, 10th Air Race Wing, United States Air Force Academy. Rod Chisholm, Deputy Garrison Commander, Fort Carson. Ron Jeffrey, Director of Staff, Shriver Air Force Base. Kirsten Aguilar, Mission Support Group Commander, Peterson Air Force Base. Dick Elsner, Park County Commissioner. Stan Vanderwerf, El Paso County Commissioner. Andy Gunning, PPACG. Peggy Littleton, El Paso County Commissioner. Mark Waller, El Paso County Commissioner. I don't know who made these, but they are absolutely amazing. <laughs> I second that. Oh, um, there's some peanut cluster delicious fat bomb. Cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we I should uh, begin by thanking our PPCG staff. I think you prepared most of that. Is that right, Andy? I can't take credit for just a portion of it. But, yeah, about 14 or so staff. Uh, did, we're baking all week, all weekend. So, yeah, did a cookie exchange yesterday and brought a badge for the board today. So awesome. Whoever, ma who, whoever made these needs to get a raise or a bonus or something. So, thank you. Right on that. <laughs> all right. Well, you've received the packet uh, either in the mail or by email. Uh, can I have a motion to, to accept the agenda, please? Second. Commissioner Littleton and, and a second from Commissioner Vanderwerf. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. At this point, we'll consider moving into an executive session uh, pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute Sections 246402B and, and F Section 1. The board in open session is to determine whether it will hold a closed executive session. Issues to be discussed involve personal matters related to the annual evaluation of the executive director of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. The chair shall poll the board members and upon consent of two-thirds of the members may hold a closed executive session. If consent to the executive session is not given, the item may be discussed in open session or withdrawal from consideration. Um, quickly, by show of hands, uh, take a, a, a vote. First of all, I could have a motion to move the executive session, please. Okay. Chairman, uh, Mayor, and uh, Council Member, uh, and uh, so by show of hands, vote please to move to executive session. Aye. Opposed. Okay, Sharon Thompson on the phone is raising her hand. Opposed, moved in executive session. Same sign. All right, we now have an executive session. I would ask, please, that those seated uh, not voting members of the board, uh, please uh, take a quick break in the hallway. We expect to make this a very short meeting. Welcome back. Uh, we're convening an open session. 
Uh, just for general information, we did not take any votes. We just discussed the, uh, both the performance evaluation and the compensation of our executive director for uh, both past performance and for uh, 2019. Uh, members of the board, could I have a, a motion on the two items we discussed, please? Move to approve a 3.2% salary increase for Andy Gunning. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on a 3.2 salary increase? See no discussion. All those in favor by vote, uh, vocal vote, say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And including this, uh, Sharon Thompson on the phone, thank you. Uh, that's an, uh, unanimous in favor. Uh, and then the second item of discussion was the bonus. I move a bonus of $3,005. Second. <laughs> Any further discussion on a bonus of uh, three thousand five? He gets the five because it's his birthday. We okay. have we have, we have a motion. To, did we have a second? I'm sorry. Second. I did second it. Okay, and, and uh, Commissioner Littleton, a second. Any further discussion on the bonus? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye. Including Sharon Gun uh, Thompson on the phone. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll then move on to um, uh, pu our public comments, and I think our first item there is a, a board photo. Are we standing? Yes. Hey, yeah, we have to bring a phone up there. Sit, okay.
<laughs> I'm glad you were behind me. There were four hands. I think there were only yeah. one finger. Yeah. It's supposed to be like remind me to not bend what it's I'd like to take our next opportunity to uh, thank one of our departing members, and uh, I'm going to take the liberty of reading this resolution myself. A resolution by the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments Board of Directors acknowledging appreciation to Commissioner Peggy Littleton, December 12, 2018. Whereas El Paso County is a member government of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, and whereas El Paso County has representative serving on the various committees of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, and whereas Peggy Littleton has served as Commissioner of El Paso County and the Pikes Peak region in an exemplary manner for the maximum number of years as allowed by law, and whereas the December 2018 Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments Board of Directors meeting is her final meeting as a member of the PPCG Board of Directors, now be it therefore resolved, the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments Board of Directors wishes to acknowledge their deepest gratitude to Commissioner Peggy Littleton for her commitment to regional planning and collaboration and for her dedication to the advancement of the PPCG organization Resolved, approved, adopted by the Board of Directors of the Pikes Peak Region this 12th day of December 2018 at Pocono Springs, Colorado. May I have a motion to approve that resolution? Second. Motion? A second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Any, any, any comments for Commissioner Littleton on her departure from the Board? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think universally um, we, we express your gratitude. I, Peggy, I, I appreciate both, uh, both your professional help and also appreciate your, prof your professional support and friendship over the years. Thank you. It's been awesome. It we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, uh, anybody else has a comment? Peggy? Yes. Sharon? Can you hear me? Sharon Thompson. We got gotcha. you. I would just like to appreciate, um, say appreciation to you for your leadership and being willing to train and bring along those of us who are new and welcoming us into the fold. And when we have questions, you always had an open door. And if you didn't know it, you got back to us. Um, but you always made us feel very welcomed and um, not just like a little flea you're bothering us. But you always <laughs> come along and be part of the team. And thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Very good. Yeah, and, and I just like to add, it's been a particular pleasure uh, to serve alongside you and, and uh, Thanks, Andy. have to have the benefit of your advice, Council, and you will be missed. So, well, thank you. All right, uh, Stan. And I just uh, would like to thank uh, Peggy Littleton for her service as well, and I'll, I'll reserve the bulk of my comments for our own board. Yeah. Farewell, but uh, just publicly here, uh, appreciate all that she's done for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a presentation for you on behalf oh of the board. Well, thank you. Uh, wow. Let me move out of the way. I recognize this mountain. <laughs> I do. So. It's Mount Herman. <laughs> <laughs> I get to take this off one more time. There's, there's no way to put lipstick on this, this pig here. So. <laughs> one more week. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for your leadership and cooperation with the board. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, that's lovely. Thank you. Comments? So, yeah, I have a couple. <laughs> so, you guys, thank you so much. That was very kind of you. Um, certainly wasn't expecting this. Um, uh, it has been a wonderful eight years being a commissioner. I have enjoyed all of the friendships that I've made throughout the community, uh, whether that be with other elected officials, with citizens, with um, our military partners and being advocates for you. Um, with my son in the Air Force, um, and my uh, advocacy will never cease for our military in thanking you for the things that you get to do. So one of these days, maybe my son will end up back in Colorado Springs. So right now he's um, going to be leaving next June and assuming a squadron command out in uh, Los Angeles. Um, so I keep trying to get him to pin on Lieutenant Colonel overseas so that I can make one more trip over there this next spring. But um, thank you guys so much. Um, unlike some elected officials, I actually do know what I'm going to do next. And so I'm actually going to go work for a company called ReadyOp. Um, as you know, my interest in emergency management and um, in large events um, is going to be very advantageous, professional staff development, training. Um, so I'm going to be the director of the Western Region, working from Colorado West. Um, so I'm going to give you out my, give my new contact information if you guys would like it, uh, so you know how to get a hold of me. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for the opportunity to serve. Yeah, here we go. 
Okay, thank you. Um, this time of year, this office appropriate, that sort of thing. And I welcome to the table Rocky Scott, our transportation commissioner. Thank you, Rocky. Could you also recognize Yeah, and uh, let me also recognize the room Holly Williams, uh, incoming yes. county commissioner for El Paso County. Welcome. And we also have Colt Simmons, incoming uh, uh, county assessor, assessor for, for Teller, Teller County. County. Teller Where, County. Did Colt already leave? Okay. Yep, he's well, also in the room. Okay. Very good. Okay, uh, we'll move on to consent items. Uh, just want to make a note that, that on the table this morning were, were th uh, two additions to item 5C, uh, adding Mark Gebhardt uh, as an alternate to the TAC and uh, Dixie Waddell as the uh, uh, representative at large to the RAC. Uh, may, did anybody like to pull an item off of the consent agenda? Saying none, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda items, please. From uh, Joe Gabler is a second. Second. Second from Commissioner Littleton. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. And that's a unanimous vote. Thank you, for gentlemen. Uh, Action item 6A, 2019 work program. Jessica McMullen. <laughs> Jessica McMullen, your policy and communications manager. <laughs> Um, as you saw, our, the PPACG work program was presented to you last month um, in an almost identical form to what you saw this month. It was taken to the CAC earlier at the last CAC meeting, and the CAC made a couple of formatting and spelling corrections for me and made no recommendations for change. They did call out that they were really impressed with our Area Agency on Aging's wide service range and the number of different services they provide. Um, and there was a lot of comments about that, actually. They didn't realize until they had read through the work program all of those details. So. It, uh, right, so the work program basically guides the day-to-day -day work of the PPCG staff. Uh, it has been synchronized, we discussed last time, with the strategic plan that we've adopted as a board. Uh, any further questions or comments for the Jessica or our executive director? Any? Mr. Chair, I'll, just, I'll mention that we did on the cover memo that you have, we pulled out about a dozen or so kind of key initiatives for 2019. Mm -hmm. Just really, it's the day-to-day -day stuff we do, but it rolls up into these kind of key things we're going to be focused on which is in sync with the strategic plan you adopted. So I appreciate the managers and directors internally. We went through and identified what are the major things we're trying to accomplish next year. And we think this is reasonable. The CAC pointed out that it's a really long list of things to try to get done, but we feel pretty good about it. And um, we look forward to reporting back on how we're making progress. Awesome. Good. Questions or comments? Discussion from the board? We have a proposed motion uh, recommended by the staff and the CAC to uh, Approve the 2019 work program. Is there such a motion? So moved. There's a motion to approve. Any? Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, for any discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. nay. Aye. Thank you. We've adopted the work program for 2019. Nice. Item 6B, Federal Fiscal Year 2019-2022 TIP, Transportation Improvement Program, Amendment Number 4. Catherine. Hello. I'm Catherine Wittwenger. I'm a transportation planner with BPACG, of course. We have had requests from CDOT and Colorado Springs to amend our transportation improvement program, which is our short-range um, federal listing of projects that we do for the next four years. Um, every once in a while, there is a request to adjust the document based on funding that has changed um, or other amendments. The two from CDOT are to add funds for a couple of their projects. These are state funds that they're adding. One is for State Highway 21 and Research Parkway to add money to their design phase. And then the other one is to add money for the State Highway 94 corridor for a PEL study, which is actually going to be discussed further by CDOT a little later on. Um, and then the final one is from Colorado Springs, and that is to cancel a project for using SDP Metro or regional money. And that's because they were unable to obligate that money by uh, June of 2020. And so we're giving it back to the region to reallocate for other projects. And I can take any other questions. Any questions for Catherine on the tip? See no questions. Is there a motion to approve? 
I move to approve. Stan, is a motion to second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving? Our, our, our proposed motion is to approve amendment number four to the 2019-2022 TIP. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay? Aye. That's, that's an aye. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Uh, uh, we have an anonymous vote of approval tip. Thank you, for Catherine. Uh, item five, uh, 6C, Area Agents and Aging, Fiscal Year 2018 Carryover and Other Funding Allocations. Joe Urban. Good morning. Joe Urban, Area Agency on Aging. A um, little bit of background. As many of you know, we have a, a dual funding process. We uh, do our primary allocation of our money uh, through a process, usually in the early part of the year before the state fiscal year begins on July 1. And then uh, sometime in generally in October, it's later this year, we uh, allocate what's called the carryover funding, which is any money, any federal money that was left over from the previous year. Um, and this is done through uh, our technical review subcommittee, uh, which is part of the RAC, the Regional Advisory Council. Uh, this year we had an exceptional amount of money because, uh, as many of you remember, we received our federal allocation extremely late last year. I think we got our last uh, option letter in April for the fiscal year that ended in June. Um, so that was a significant chunk of money. And then in addition, uh, Governor Hickenlooper included an additional $4 million statewide for senior services. Uh, that did not come in until after our allocation was established for the year. So we, uh, we ended up with roughly one28 million dollars to allocate in that uh, carryover extra funding. Uh, we were able to allocate about half of that. We will have another cycle come January to uh, allocate the, the remaining money. Um, we looked at the proposals through the TRS and we're coming to you today basically to ask for approval of that allocation. It's uh, on a spreadsheet that you have in your packet. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, this is a broke up. Yes, Commissioner Elner. Elner. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, when you look at this, everybody uh, will probably notice Park County got hit very hard in this allocation. Like We got nothing for our transportation. But I do want to say um, I, I can't speak for the senior coalition, but I've been working with Joe, and he has been more than helpful yes. in trying to figure out what our issues are. We're in a unique situation in that we're far away from everything. Um, and uh, I recognize we do have a lot of troubles with our senior coalition and the accounting and everything they need to be able to account for how we're using the money. Uh, so I just wanted to thank Joe for his help. He has volunteered to help us get our accounting straightened out, and I look forward to coming back and getting some money in January. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Any other comments, questions? I just right. want to make a comment. Go ahead, Peg. So well, I just I want to thank um, Joe. I'm, I can't tell you the number of people that he's helped in our community that come my way that I've been able to pass off to um, he, he and his staff. Um, they do a phenomenal mm -hmm. job. And so I think you guys utilize every dollar you get to the extreme maximum amount. Thanks. Great. Any other comments? All right. We have a proposed motion to approve the funding allocations as delineated in the attached spreadsheet, the back side of the uh, item 6C. Any further discussion? All, uh, may I have a motion, please? Move. Move okay, a motion to approve. Second. A second. Any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay? Aye. Uh, thank you, Sharon. All right, we have a uh, thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. And then, uh, item uh, that concludes our action items and we'll on to discussion items. A legislative committee update. We've met, and uh, Jessica, update us, please. I am just up here to say, Jessica McMullen, your policy and communications manager. The legislative committee did meet um, for 2019. Anyone who is interested may still join if you were not able to attend that meeting. And the committee did, did designate co-chairs. So we would like to thank... Commissioner Stan Vanderwerth of El Paso County and Commissioner Dick Elsner of Park County for agreeing to be our chairs. And I'll let you guys and I'll take over and chat about where we went. Okay. Go ask our co-chairs make any comments, Stan or Dick? Well, I was just going to say it was a great meeting. Um, I think the group came together understanding how we are going to approach a lot of our issues. Everybody has their own individual issues, but... As a group, we have a lot of things that are in common, and I think uh, when we came up with the 
our, our goals, which are basically uh, make sure the legislature does no harm to anyone in our region and then try to encourage them to actually help us in uh, transportation and water quality and, and all those things. I think we're uh, heading off in the right direction, and I look forward to working with everybody. Stan? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the things that will be important for us to do as we go through this legislative session is to be uh, communicating with the whole board as much as possible and getting uh, input from the board about what we collectively decide are our, our, our priorities. Because uh, as you all know, well know, we can't fight every battle. We need to pick those battles and pick the ones that have uh, the most impact. Um, if it's a positive impact, to be fighting for it, and if it's a negative impact, to be doing what we can to kind of block and tackle it. So those will be important things for us to do, and I look forward to working with the board, uh, communicating to the board what the, this group is going to be doing, but also getting feedback from the board so that we can uh, represent this board in those activities. So thanks. Mm -hmm. We did have President uh, Lauren Furman, who's been uh, re-engaged for 2019 as our legislative state lobbyist. Um, uh, we also committed to to her and to cooperate uh, both in testimony on letters of support uh, on a very responsive measure. Sometimes things happen very quickly, especially late in the session, to be as, as responsive and aware of things as they go through. So, uh, now that legislative committee of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Government does not preclude local uh, 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 member governments from engaging on their own, and encourage you if there's an issue that's before the legislature that affects your county, your city, municipality. Uh, encourage you to um, engage uh, individually, and if there's issues that would be appropriate to the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, to bring that issue from your government to this board for perhaps letters of support on a local issue. Um, so we tend to be very proactive, very advocating, very engaging in our legislative session, and we're also going to be um, we doing some events, I think, coming up in Denver. Maybe you could give us a quick we summary. We are planning there. to do a legislative breakfast up in Denver in early February, where we'll do probably meet in a committee room and have food and breakfast in the hallway, but that way we can meet with all of our delegation and those committee members who are involved in bills that we are monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, other highlights from the discussion were that we will be working to develop some themes that we can share with the entire board and our legislature, and we will be sharing with all of you our legislators' contact information and sharing many, anybody who gave it to me's um, contact information with our legislators so that they can reach out to us for subject matter expertise and for help with testimony. So if there's an issue before the legislature would affect your city or your county, expect to be contacted by our local legislators on your view. Uh, for, uh, we, we would, we're going to work to encourage that. Uh, very timely uh, co uh, communication between our legislative and our local governance. So um, maybe a quick update on our federal engagement. Um, we did discuss the impact coalition, which PPACG has been a member of for several years. At this point in time, the legislative committee looked at the direction they are going and how our involvement with impact has gone and is suggesting that we not rejoin that coalition for 2019. And instead, as Sharon Thompson had suggested during the budget period, keep the $10,000 in the budget for items of particular need um, or on-the-spot involvement in federal legislation. Okay. Stan? Yeah. Yes, sir, thank you. So for the, uh, for the board's understanding as far as like uh, going forward, uh, the, the PPACG staff is working on some recommendations, some of these major themes. They're doing that research. Um, they're using some examples from uh, some other organizations that have made these kinds of themes before. And this board um, uh, that Dick and I are the co-chairs on will be meeting again in early January to review those themes and provide our input to those. So that's the going forward part, which I think is important for this board to know. So just to further clarify, the themes are general uh, things that we uh, as a board are in favor and supportive, not speaking of specific bills or legislation, but general themes and, and that we are in support of. We, we propose to develop those themes to give additional flexibility to our legislative folks, to the, both to the committee and, and to uh, Lauren Furman on the spot, but then we'll take up individual bills as they come up. So um, any questions or comments on the legislative um, committee 
actions. Just one more thing. Those themes will be presented to the full board, not just the legislative committee, right. at our January meeting as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and thanks for clarifying. Because there are, we want to make sure that the entire board is engaged. The legislative act committee is, is actually doing the front lines of that. But if you have specific guidance, we want to make sure that the entire board uh, is engaged and giving guidance and direction to the committee. Terry? I just want to throw something in. Uh, uh, I'm disappointed that the COG is not going to participate in impact, and I'm sure others will be as well. Okay. All right, move on then to um, in, sorry. No, move on then to uh, item, uh, information items are CDOT, update item 8A, start with uh, presentation on State Highway 94 safety study outcome. Shane Ferguson, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Again, Shane Ferguson, a resident engineer out of the Colorado Springs office with CDOT. Um, I want to first by acknowledging my team. Uh, Dole Gromenick is the project engineer for this uh, project. It's been a great project so far. We hope to go forward with it continually. And then uh, Stantec has been the consultant team on this project. Let me drive the slideshow. And I believe we have extra handouts for slides to pass out for anyone that uh, doesn't have it in their hands. And we'll get moving here. Okay. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. So project overview. Um, this project really is a safety study identifying what the corridor needs um, as far as traffic volumes and capacity um, from Mark Shuffle to Elkhart Highway um, is really to identify um, uh, potential accidents, that uh, accident history data, crash data, um, traffic counts, uh, traffic patterns, uh, capacity, current capacity and needs in the future. Uh, we wanted to, oops, we wanted to identify um, what what really is going on on the corridor with respect to volume <clears throat> and capacity from Mark Shuffle out past um, Shriver Air Force Base and beyond to Peyton Highway. Um, so the next slide is really identifying the existing conditions and what we, what we were to um, evaluate. So we took a look at the major intersections at uh, US-24, Mark Shuffle, and Curtis, and Enoch. Um, we also identified really what's the primary land use in that corridor being waste management currently um, kind of a rural corridor as well as Shriver Air Force Base. Um, and from the chart identified up, up, up there, we, went, we uh, really broke the corridor out into about six different major sections. Um, we wanted to take a look at PM and AM peak period volumes and what's really happening along the corridor. Um, on, the, on the chart, we have the first column uh, about midway through is PTSF, which is uh, described as percent time spent following a vehicle. Um, the next is volume, actual volume along the corridor, and then volume to capacity ratio, and then level of service. Um, what you'll notice is the percent time spent following along the corridor is really pretty high, and that's what's driving this level of service of an E, um, D, and E along the corridor. Um, the volume, actual volume versus capacity along the corridor is, is about 60% 60, 60 to 75% of what the capacity needs to be. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question, just to sure. clarify, your percent time spent following yes, sir. is a new term I haven't heard before, but I'm assuming that that means the time you're spent following someone in front of you? That is correct. And so that really that front vehicle, whatever it may be, is really dictating speed, dictating what your speed is, that yeah. corridor is, and really a perceived uh, mobility, a perceived uh, what's happening in front. So that is correct. And so that, that really is driving um, this metric of level of service in this capacity. And it really explains what's happening on the corridor as I get into a little bit further. Um, so it's not the times, percent of the time spent following the guy through the red light. That no. is correct. It is, it's, 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 that's, that's right. Um, so, but I think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can, can you kind of give us a little bit of an explanation of what an E stands for in sure. level of service? Yeah, my, my or apologies. Or a D or a C? So level of service A is essentially free flow. Uh, you're, you're, you're not impeded by traffic. 
um, you're, you're able to get onto uh, the facility and, and maintain your speed. Um, as you progress down uh, B, C, D, E, and F, F is high congestion, very, very restrictive flow, um, and having a very difficult time actually maneuvering and, and maintaining your mobility at, at the posted speed. Um, an example um, for, for a rural highway, we would, we would accept level of service C and D as being fairly commonplace and, and, and uh, expected where we start approaching, I'd say D to E and F, that's really a failure of the facility. Um, any additional questions? Great. Um, and so one of the things that came out of the study that really is, is driving, I, say, I believe it's percent time spent following is um, if you're familiar with the corridors on State Highway 94, we mentioned the uh, land use of the, the landfill. Um, a lot of the truck traffic currently on that corridor is about 13%, and it really starts to dive off at Blaine, which is the entrance to the landfill. Um, also along that corridor is the passing lane section as you, as you um, head eastbound on the corridor. That passing lane section ends essentially at Blaney right where that um, uh, sanitary landfill section um, turnoff is. And so what's happening is a lot of the trash trucks are maneuvering up the hill on 94, getting into that left-hand lane of that passing section in preparation for turning left into um, the trash sanitary landfill area. And so the passing lane section on eastbound 94 is not functioning as a passing lane section. It's actually functioning as an extended left turn bay. Um, and so that's, that's, that kind of gives you a little bit of an explanation of the discrepancy between percent time spent following a vehicle versus the actual volume along that corridor. Any additional questions? So my apologies if I'm breaking up a little bit here. <laughs> we'll get moving along. Um, if we have our partners from the installation out there, feel free to jump in with questions or comments anytime. Yeah. Along the, um, in addition to the, the, the uh, capacity and mobility study, we, we wanted to take a look at safety along the corridor. Um, we took a, a broad scope from 2012 to 2016, about a five-year period, to identify what, what type of incidents were along the corridor. Um, in that five-year period, uh, we're looking at about 180, 190 accidents um, annually, anywhere between 30 to 45. And the predominant number of accidents were rear-end accidents. And that can be pretty well assigned to as someone that, as, as we were discussing, percent time spent following, maybe some impatience, maybe someone that's wanting to uh, get around and, and maneuver around another vehicle, a trash truck or slower moving vehicle, um, um, and not necessarily seeing that, that vehicle stopping. Plus, in addition to the Mark Shuffle and Curtis intersections where you do, uh, you could see some additional um, rear end accidents. So the majority of our pattern, accident pattern along that corridor is definitely rear end accidents. Um, we did want to take a look at what is projected future growth along the corridor. And I would say what is identified here is pretty aggressive um, in and, and, and what that, that volume would be. Um, we're showing level of service based off of capacity really starting to fail in 2025, 2030, and 2040. And that's based off of some of the conversations we've had with Norwood. But I would, I would, I would highlight that that's a, that is an aggressive um, projection. Um, we did take into account Shreve Air Force Base build out, but um, really what's driving um, any uh, future capacity needs would be the build out of Benny Lewis Ranch. So the next steps that we are proposing to move forward on is really what do we want to do along corridor on, on State Highway 94? Well, we believe addressing that eastbound passing lane is really one of the first steps that we want to address. And that could be any number of solutions. What we're going to try to focus on is really a left turn bay um, that we may extend all the way to the bottom of the hill to move that high percentage of truck traffic off of the passing lane section and allow that passing lane section to be utilized as it's, it's designed for. Um, we want to extend that passing lane section. Like I said, at, right now it ends at the top of the hill. So with that truck turning traffic moving on to Blaney, as well as trying to merge in into a passing lane. There's a lot of turbulence that's happening at the top of the hill. So I really want to try to extend that passing lane to another 2,000 foot and just allow for that passer to movement to, to function as it should be. In addition to that, we want to look at adding a passing lane section westbound 
really west of Blaney to capture those high volume of truck traffic that's going to move on to State Highway 94 west into Colorado Springs and allow that high volume of traffic during peak periods to pass um, slower moving vehicles. So ballpark a mile to two mile long passing lane section west of Blaney um, down the hill close between Blaney and Coral, Coral Valley Road is essentially what we're going to look at. And then lastly, we really want to start looking at, well, when the build-out happens, um, what is our section going to look like, a four-lane section? So we want to provide about a 10 to 20% 20, 20 design, um, go ahead and survey the corridor, start taking a look at what type of NEPA document we will need if there's additional right-of-way. And so we want to go ahead and pursue um, designing that 10 to 20% section along that corridor working with our partners with the, with the Air Force Base and the county and identifying how far do we take that section out um, and lengthwise if we end it at Curtis, Enoch, or take it to Peyton Highway. Um, and so that's, that's really our next steps that we want to pursue. Um, and, and as part of that um, effort, obviously we were talking about the PEL earlier, it would be a little bit more of a NEPA document, I would believe, that would be addressed um, for that, uh, that four-lane section. So. With that, I definitely want to entertain any questions. Questions for Andy? I have a question. Um, and, and, and over here first, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And then Neil. Um, did I understand you said you wanted to put a passing lane on the downhill section? Yeah, we want to start looking at um, okay. for the westbound movement, um, really identifying west of Blaney. And, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't laid out the location exactly, but definitely – um, we want to be able to capture the truck traffic that is heading westbound off of the, the, the uh, uh, landfill area heading into Colorado Springs. And so as, as, the, as, our, as our traffic is moving along the corridor, you know, it's posted essentially 65 um, right. along that corridor. So we want to be able to provide a, a section there that, that can pass. Um, oh, it, it makes perfect sense to me. I just, mm -hmm. what, what caught my attention was it sounded like you said you're going to put the passing lane on the downhill section, which... I, I've seen enough trucks use downhill to pick up speed. I'm not sure the passing lane would necessarily work. Yeah, so there's, there's definitely um, what we've identified. Um, in, in fact, when we were out there speaking with the um, uh, the Colonel from Grant on the Air Force Base as we were traveling back, I mean, there's definitely a platooning of, of vehicles as as the uh, trash trucks are moving off of Blaney onto State Highway uh, 94. You know, you'll have a, a, a platoon of 10 to 15 vehicles that are, you know, 40, 45 miles an hour, almost all the way up to Mark Shuffle, even though it is a downhill section. Oh, yeah, no no, no argument on that point. Uh, yes, although I'd probably say it's probably more, in an Army term, with more of a battalion, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice question. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm sorry, uh, Mayor? Yeah, um, yes, two questions. One, um, have you done a cost analysis on any idea what would cost? For the two turning lanes in two, I'll just answer, ask both questions. Do you have a sense for um, what the forecast would look like, assuming we have the, the turning lanes going both ways? So the um, I'll start with the first question on the cost estimate. Right now, we're at a very, very high level estimate. Um, we're, we're looking at anywhere from 3 to $5 million for construction for the passing lane section, as well as any additional improvements for the, for the eastbound um, fix, if you will, of the passing lane section. And then uh, your second question, the, I'm sorry, what was that again? Well, just relative to your forecast, how would oh. that change? Uh, so the level of service identified here is, again, a function of the percent time spent following. So if we looked at it as a capacity issue, we believe it will definitely increase. It will be a, essentially we're going to look at more of a level of service C, D is, is what I would expect. And so that's uh, correct. Great. Thank you. With respect to percent time spent following now, when it comes to the build out of Banny Lewis Ranch and we start to have that capacity need, that's when I would say it's definitely going to change again. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Shane, I just want to Excuse thank me. I just want to thank you guys and CDOT for you know looking at this. Um, certainly, if nothing else, uh, during my eight years, enough nagging, enough meetings to try to get this done, going through enough base commanders out at Shreveport Air Force Base, um, I'm happy to see that this is going to happen in the future and is a great consideration. You know, we've worked with the base commander out there to do flex time when people come, when people leave, to try to reduce you know any fatalities for some of our airmen. Um, you know, we know that we're going to have increased personnel out there. We certainly want to take that into account. You know, development out at the end of Enoch Road, you know, on the on the other side. 
Um, and certainly, you know, we've moved forward in the county of having, you know, uh, development help pay transportation impact fees. And so for them to be engaged and involved with CDOT2 as we look at those uh, in the future, um, I know that our county engineer, I think I saw Jennifer here somewhere, is, is working on that. So, um, yay, I'm glad that I was a squeaky wheel and this is moving forward with a lot of partners within the community. Great, thank you. Mark? Thank you. What, what are we looking at as the time frame here? And is that changing based on how we perceive the legislature moving forward in the next couple of years? Great. So the time frame with respect, I'd say, on the pre-construction side, getting the survey and the design done, we want to move forward with that um, this spring. Um, I'd say my first efforts will definitely survey the corridor. Um, and, and turn around beyond that, it's really getting that pre-construction, getting the, getting the plans and, and specs and, and uh, looking at the environmental document next. I'd say at an aggressive schedule, if funding were to become available. Are, are the dollars identified? Uh, dollars are not identified for okay. construction, not as of yet. And if they were valid, identified, our TIP currently goes out to 2022. Uh, would you expect it in that TIP cycle or beyond 2022? Uh, definitely within that TIP cycle. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, with respect to any of the major, the interim improvements, I would not say that for the four-lane section, but interim improvements, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Stan? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I, a couple of questions on some of the charts, and um, it, it, not necessarily trying to challenge, you know, the need for this or whatever, because, you know, I used to drive that when I worked at Schriever, and that was a long, long time ago, and I thought the road was dangerous back then. Mm -hmm. But sure. having said that, on one of the charts here, you're actually showing a decrease in crashes per year from, I don't know, something on the order of 43 to something on the order of 33 uh, per year. So um, is this because of some minor improvements that you've been making on the road that have helped that, or does it just seem to be trending down of its own accord? Or I would say part of it is it's trending down on its own accord, but one of the phenomena that can happen with respect to you know increased capacity or increased volume is you, you can have somewhat of the uh, reduce in, 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 in accidents. Uh, people are moving slower. People are not 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 able to uh, uh, maneuver as fast. And so that that would be my answer for. Okay. Uh, and you you noticed uh, or you talked about a um, a 2,000 foot passing lane extension. Mm -hmm. I have to imagine you have some expectations about the value generation of that. Some type of reduction in wait time. Some type of perhaps reduction in crashes. So what's your assessment of that? I right now don't have uh, anything for you. That, that, that was just really a high level assessment as far as, you know, yeah. looking at where the passing lane currently is ending and terminating at Blaney. Um, what's other movements that are happening at Blaney with the, with the turn <coughs> movements, the turning movements, um, just a really large volume of, of turbulence happening just at that one peak of the, the hill um, um, at location. Okay. And then one last question. Uh, um, on this uh, future traffic forecast, if I understand it correctly, you're assuming um, a 35% growth. You call it a 35% build-out, but is that really like a 35% growth in that traffic? Is, that's 35% build-out in Bainey Lewis Ranch's um, um, land use. That, that's based off of our, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Freddie, that 35%, this is Freddie Heath from our Stantec, but the 35% was yes. primarily the land use build-out. Maybe want to come up to the microphone, please. Yeah. We'll take a moment. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you, everyone. So we talked to uh, Norwood, which is the main developer, uh, current developer of the Benning Louis Ranch, and they are in the process of a new master planning of the whole development. Uh, so their best guesstimate as of now is by 2040, they are envisioning the 35% uh, of Benning Lewis Ranch is going to be built out. We also asked what about the interim years that we're looking at, including 2025 and 2030. So they said, well, if you assume 5% of built out by 2025, which is only seven years from now, they <coughs> think it's realistic. And also 15% uh, built out by 2030. That's their, their current estimate. But they did put out a caveat saying that we're, we're still in the early stage of the uh, new master planning or the master planning revisions. We don't know as of now whether those numbers are going to stand. They may change in the next few months. Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah, just an observation. Obviously, that you're talking about residential traffic buildup, but also construction traffic. We're talking about truckloads of framing and lumber and so on would be on that same road, I would guess, Correct. right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Neil? And, and would you have any sense of what 5% looks like number-wise, home-wise? What's 5%? Uh, the the five percent we're looking at the the full uh, full built out being like sixty six thousand uh, uh, that's the population increase in Betting Louis rents um, and that also the development includes it's not only residential development it's multi use and there's commercial development as well as entertainment uh, so number wise I can't think on top of my uh, of my head it's is in terms of uh, impact to uh, Highway 94, including the roadway segments as well as the intersections, we're looking at probably somewhere between several hundred vehicles increase uh, during the peak uh, commute hours. So that's pretty significant. Um, I just wanted to see that if our military partners who represent Shriver would have any comments on that, just as, as far as when we look at crashes or, or things like that. I know that there's been some behavior, you know, I don't want to say modification, but just some things that you guys have done that have impacted that as well. Absolutely. Uh, Ron Javery from uh, Shriver. So certainly one thing that we emphasize uh, continually is safety, uh, to include uh, safety on the roads. So we make sure that that's a part of our safety education program every year that goes out to uh, everybody uh, there at Shriver. We certainly appreciate the efforts of CDOT and look forward to, uh, to partnering and, and working with them to make sure that, uh, that uh, our needs are identified along with those of the local community. In a, in a weird uh, twist of fate, about two weeks ago, our deputy director of safety was involved in a traffic accident on <laughs> Highway 94. Uh, luckily, he wasn't injured, but his uh, his car was totaled. So certainly, we, we realize that there is danger on that road, and we continue to emphasize that uh, as an area that our folks need to pay particular attention to. But again, we certainly appreciate everything that CDOT's doing to, to uh, make it better and to make sure that the road supports both our needs and the growing needs of the community. Thank you. Anything else, Shane? Thank you. Any questions? Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, um, from Peterson's perspective, I just want to commend uh, CDOT for taking this um, undertaking and conducting this study because all the airmen that work at Schriever, um, they live at Peterson, the airmen who live in the dorms. There's no dorms at Schriever. So all the young airmen that work there live on Peterson and they make that commute. And we have several other families that work at Schriever but live on base at Peterson. So we're very grateful for. Um, the opportunity to partner with our folks at Shriver, but just commend CDOT for taking a look at this because this is an area of, of grave concern. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, Rocky. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think this might be a good time for some additional context in that um, I don't think there's a good understanding. Well, I shouldn't say that. I know there's not a good understanding around the state of the importance of the national defense, importance of the missions that we're, that we're doing here. Uh, Shriver is really just one example. It is it is the the most critical near term example. But as a practical matter, if our transportation system doesn't adequately serve Peterson and and Carson in the Academy and Shriver, the impact is not just El Paso County. The, mm -hmm. the impact on the ability of these soldiers, sailors, and airmen to get their job done has potentially national defense implications. So had a discussion with the commission, the other transportation commissioners last week about beginning to recognize this higher level obligation that we have to, um, to as a state, as a community, and as a state to make sure that um, we understand those needs very clearly and we're doing everything we can to meet them. Andy and I have talked about this and John quite a bit. I don't, that doesn't mean I have an answer. I, I will say that when it comes to Commissioner Waller's question about where's the money, um, I've made it clear to the commissioners that, that taking care of Shriver's immediate needs is kind of a non-negotiable issue from my perspective. And we're making some very, very difficult decisions, as you know, about how we distribute a very small amount of money across what in this county I think is probably over a $3 billion uh, need that, that currently we don't, nobody knows where the money will be um, to prioritize these missions. So. 
I'm, I'm very encouraged about the conversations with the staff. I, I don't know if we have anything scheduled, Andy, as we've discussed before, about talking about the big picture for overall transportation infrastructure in the county, because it clearly mm -hmm. this is a system, and the state highway system is critically important because it provides, like, I would guess, virtually all of the major arterials. But if you can't get the state highway system because you're all clogged up on the on the city and county uh, par portions of the system, we have a we still have a system problem. So, sure. so that dialogue has started both with the staff here and from a funding perspective with the commission. To the extent that we have the ability to put money into these critical issues, um, I'm seeing some head nodding. Obviously, you can't do any can't be any guarantees, but some head nodding that acknowledges that these kinds of challenges have to be met as quickly and as effectively as possible. Mark, and this is a little off the subject, I apologize. Do you, I, I know the JVC is talking about the budget right now. What's the transportation budget going to be looking like moving forward? Because I've heard some discussion from the governor-elect that says, look, you know, we're not going to be putting near as much money into transportation, and you know, local governments are going to have to come up with more and more of the share. So do you, do you know where the discussions are related to transportation funding? Well, there are quite a few, as, as you imagine. One of the interesting questions is there will continue to be some additional uh, state budget surpluses related to the, to the uh, federal tax cuts, as we know. There are also a lot of demands. I mean, there is not a, there's not a single discretionary part of the state budget um, that doesn't have adequate advocates that say look at the history and look where our caseload growth is, and there's no way we have enough money to get the job done. So how you split up that, you know, it could be a billion dollars, maybe according to the to ledge council. Um, for the coming year, you don't know year after year after that what it is. But, Mark, I wish I, wish I knew the answer to that, and I, and I don't. We, don't. we aren't sure who the new executive director will be. As you know, that process, in fact, I think last week was when they thought they might come up with a name, but I haven't, I haven't seen one. Um, so there are a lot of questions. The, the overall issue of what the Polis administration policy is with regard to, you know, asphalt versus transit and those kinds of things, we've, we've, there's been a lot of talk. Um, but I don't think they, frankly, have had the time to translate that into any specific plans. We certainly haven't seen them. This afternoon will be – the commission meets t uh, today and tomorrow, and we'll be talking more about that. Great. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from the board? Andy? And, and to Rocky's point, um, John and I need to put our heads together, and probably in the context of our 2045 plan that we're working on right now, that's going to be adopted by November of next year. Uh, we, we're working with CDOT right now to look at what our revenue projections look like for our region, and I think as we get that compiled along with the project list that we've been getting from all the jurisdictions, I, I think it would be good to have that conversation with the board probably first quarter of 2019 um, once we're ready with the project side and the revenue side and, and talk about what the extraordinary overall needs are, both on the local regional system and, and the state system. So we'll, we'll stay tuned. Okay. That's why we're all here. Okay. All right. Thank you for the presentation. Very much. Uh, we um, just I'm just want hobby while taking a break just before Brian we had a really a productive meeting I thought yesterday with CDOT staff uh, John Hall with on managed lane guidelines very productive meeting I thought yesterday so there's discussion about uh, our input our thoughts on the uh, CDOT internal document on how managed lanes are uh, 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 how are they prioritized, how they're developed, and, and how they fit into the overall scheme of moving track on the state. So just want to again thank you, CDOT, uh, for, for that role. Brian Potts, JLIS update. Very appropriate. We're, we just queued I, this up well I, for absolutely. you. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. While, the, uh, while they're getting the PowerPoint uh, op opened, I definitely want to tack on to what was just said because uh, the great segue yeah. because – this is one of the high-level issues that's been identified within the study, and we have a very, you know, a high-level discussion in there, just identifying that State Highway 94 is very important to both Peterson and Schriever, uh, for and and therefore the community interaction on on supporting that is is a key component of uh, supporting military missions within our area. So uh, that's one of those things that we we do have noted as a top priority, um, and we also talk about in there. Um, uh, just to check, I uh, need the PowerPoint presentation for, thank you, or the PDF is fine. Um, just general coordination. Um, with 
with the 2045 plan coming up, actually, uh, could you do the PDF? That's not turned out all right. Yeah, there should be a PDF in that folder. Okay. There we go. Um, all right, I'll, I'll just start there and I'll tack, tack back in with uh, transportation here in a moment. But uh, one of the, actually I'll go ahead and just mention it now. One of the things that we're gonna do as needed is um, as we get into implementation funding, which I'll talk about at, towards the end of this presentation, um, we're gonna do what we can from the Joint Land Use Study Program to uh, be supportive, play a supportive role uh, through that 2045 uh, plan, long range plan where needed. Uh, if there's something we need to do to draft something related to language um, associated with military and the JLS, we're going to be performing that function. So that's just something else to note. Uh, that's how we hope to provide a support role with that. Um, some of you have seen me present recently at some of your boards, councils. We're going around and, and talking with various um, uh, county commissioners and uh, city councils and planning commissions to kind of give an overview of where the study is. on. Uh, the plan is that uh, at our meeting uh, for the policy committee and technical committee on Wednesday that we'll be uh, formally ending uh, the study report and finalizing that as uh, our funding does run out on December 31st for this process, so we've crammed in as much as we can. Um, again, just as a reminder, it's a four-county study area that we were dealing with. Uh, so within that, we have a total population at this point within the four counties of a little over 900,000 with an expectation that by 2045 per state dem demographics, uh, we're looking at about 1.3 million within that four county region by 2045. So we expect growth will continue and therefore um, as that growth continues, we expect military operations will also continue to drive some of that growth as more missions come on. Uh, and with that, we'll see the number in terms of the economic output continuing to increase over time. And during that process, uh, we've, during the process of this report, we've tried to identify some of those ways that the communities uh, and, and stakeholders can help support with um, continued military operations and making sure that that capacity continues to be there as mission uh, grows. So with that, we had 100 meetings, over 100 meetings with various stakeholder groups, uh, committees, um, we had nine working groups. Uh, the study draft was out for public comment. That comment period ended December 7th. We did get about uh, 20 public comments on that, um, which is gonna uh, change just a few items, very minor ways. But for the most part, we think we've been able to address all the comments and you'll see those reflected in the final, final draft. Uh, the draft is online currently. We've left that up even though the comment period has ended. So if anyone is interested to see what's, what's in there, feel free to browse. Uh, the website is, is on there, but if you go to the JLS page, you'll be able to find the, the study report. Um, some of the key findings that I just wanted to highlight, uh, there's, there's more than this, but these are just high level. Um, coordination and communication kept coming up throughout the process as being the, the, the core underlying factor to make sure everything else works. Uh, having those relationships between the military and the community, which do exist here, is, is a fundamental piece of making sure that everything else works when it comes to uh, land use and development reviews, transportation coordination. Uh, uh, if an issue comes up, knowing that you're able to pick up the phone and know who to call on the civilian side or the civilian side calling the military side, knowing who you need to talk to to start figuring out how do we start to work towards a solution. Uh, civilian and military stakeholders we're already partnering to do that, but obviously there's gonna be room for improvement and there's gonna be new issues that come up. So what we tried to do in this document is recognize that there is this infrastructure, this, this communications infrastructure there that can be utilized. And through implementation, we're hoping that we continue to bolster that and help map that out in, in a way that you know, maybe we can provide some additional tools. Um, citizens, also the other outcome was citizens they, they, the information is out there, but sometimes citizens are unaware as to where to find it. Uh, we were able to find it, we know where to look, but we're going to try and work on helping uh, the community partners and the military with uh, repackaging some of that information into some brochures. Some of the people that experience some of these operations, they may be in a rural area that doesn't have internet access. They don't go to a website regularly. Uh, we found that out when we went to some of the county fairs that there's a lot of people that they, they, they see things flying overhead all the time. They're just sort of curious, not concerned, but curious. What is that? What are they doing? Why are they doing that? 
and we were able to find the information online, but it's just a matter of how can we help facilitate getting that information to some of these citizens that want it. So we're going to be looking at that as well. Stormwater, wildfire management, transportation issues were, were noted as being uh, key common uh, interests for both the military and the community. So we expect that over time uh, that there's already a lot going on with uh, cooperation on emergency services and, and fire but, uh, and, and transportation for that matter. But, and we've noted that in the study. But we're going to, uh, we recognize there's going to need to be continued dialogue with that, with all of those, to keep improving uh, the systems in place in order to uh, uh, do a better, just continue to improve. So there are 12 strategies that I have here on the slides. Um, I'm not going to go through each one, but uh, some of the key outcomes of these strategies, uh, you know, in particular natural disasters ties into um, uh, the, the stormwater and, uh, and, and wildfire issues. But we're working on taking all those strategies and we have put in a, a prelim we've put, handed an application off to the uh, Office of Economic Adjustment with a full uh, scope of what we were looking to do for implementation. We're awaiting some minor, uh, some comments from them on minor tweaks we need to make before it's, it's formalized, but uh, that's in process. Uh, some of the key things to note is, um, with that, is we're planning to convert uh, should we receive the funding, which we do have a pretty good assurance we're going to get more funding for that. Uh, the Joint Land Use Study Committees will uh, be converted and, and reformatted as implementation committees to be there as a way to help support with uh, certain recommended actions as the community see fit. Um, we're going to also work on uh, developing some of these materials we talked about with uh, public outreach, with understanding some of the military operations in the area and where people can go if they want to learn more information. Um, and then also working with uh, uh, local jurisdictions, particularly El Paso County as they go through the, uh, the comprehensive plan, master plan update, we're going to try and provide some additional uh, technical uh, uh, services, as it were, with some sub-area planning uh, around the Air Force Academy and around Peterson uh, as needed. So we're going to coordinate and kind of see where that process is going and then provide that as, as sort of some sub-area planning related to military use as we go forward. And so the exact details of that will be determined as we see how that process starts to unfold. Um, so with that, we are hoping that we will still be here uh, after December 31st. Well, we're planning to still be here. We're just awaiting the finalization of, of that uh, application process. And uh, we really have enjoyed working with all of you throughout this study process. Uh, we're hearing good feedback that people are happy with the, the, the end of it. Obviously, as the manager, I can see a lot of things I wish I could have done more with, but uh, with the capacity we had, I think we've ended up with a pretty good tool at 295 pages. So I don't think we want to go too much further with that. So, um, At this point, are there any other questions or comments or anything you need to know from me? Uh, we're looking to do that. Technical committee will vote on that at 10 a.m. on uh, Wednesday, December 19th. Uh, vote to recommend to the policy committee. Policy committee will then vote to accept. I, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying that that's the vote uh, that, that will be taken as to whether to accept it as complete okay. uh, on, at uh, 11 a.m. Uh, for the policy committee. Right. Questions, then, comments for, for Brian? Yes, Dan? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Brian and I, you've talked, <coughs> we've talked a couple times before in a I really appreciate the work that you've been doing. I think there's some interesting findings in this report. You know, a couple of those kind of translating into my own words, kind of perhaps the biggest one is we have a lot of cooperation and coordination between the community and the bases, which is fantastic. But we actually have so much that sometimes we, uh, the, can, the communication can be confused. Some of it translates well in some areas, but maybe not in other areas. So there's this component of better, uh, trying to figure out how to do that a little bit better. Uh, but it has no real statement about the relationship that we have between everybody because that's really solid. It's just about trying to be better at that. And then I think another one kind of translates to something we discussed earlier, 94, going mm -hmm. out to Schriever, very important. And a third one that I, I think is important is, uh, and you kind of hinted at it, uh, Air Force Academy and the Colorado Springs Airport, uh, the um, growth in uh, residential and the encroachment onto those facilities, which is sending us, we're, we're kind of already there in, in a challenge at the Air Force Academy, and we're going there with the Colorado Springs Airport. And this is something that if we deal with it in a proactive way up front, we can maybe prevent a lot of the relationship challenges that could come as a result. 
So having said that, those are kind of three takeaways that I have, and there's more in here that I think is really valuable. I think one thing for us to work on on this board is how to take the output of this report and um, see if there's a way we can turn at least a few of those things into concrete action. And I would recommend we deliberate over how to do that because I think there's some real valuable stuff here, so thanks. And, and that's a great point for me to follow up with how I've been, been engaging citizens on this, is that when I'm explaining what this report is, in many cases this is the first time many of these items have been documented or, or, or put into one place in this context. And so I keep explaining uh, to citizens when they ask, well, what is this document doing, is that this is a starting point. This is the beginning. It's, it's somewhat of a road map to kind of help guide uh, some things forward. And so it's, it's sort of this is where things are right now. And then uh, as, as decision makers and, and people that uh, um, uh, are, are keyed into the citizens, it's a, it's a tool for you to use with that kind of action. So we hope that it is, we've been successful in doing it. It would be fair to say centralized planning but decentralized execution. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Brian, thank you guys for what you've done on this. I know I just want to thank our military partners, too, for working on this um, because we all know how critical this is to um, our national defense and to the economic vitality of our region. Um, and as, as we look at this uh, moving forward, I think it's really, uh, you know, would we have had something like this in place and had studies, you know, before wind farm days? Um, you know, there might have been some different decisions. Um, you know, put out there and certainly, you know, how that impacts our military, how it impacts our region as well. Um, so continue to be a strong voice for that uh, within our region. Any other comments? Uh, I just invite our military partners. Any comments? Uh, we're ready to wrap up here. Any thoughts? Closing thoughts? Uh, Ron? Yeah, Ron Jeffrey from uh, Schriever. Certainly we've been uh, glad to participate as partners with you and look forward to continuing to work with you as we move to implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I would I would uh, repeat that for Fort Carson. I know we've maintained relationships just with the transportation experts within the local communities, but to kind of pull it all together into this report and as you said, Brian, to sort of lay it out as the beginning of a road map so we can turn some things into actual action, I think it's been pretty good. and. For us, we were pretty fortunate. A lot of work had been done by this uh, council and, and transportation on Highway 115 in the past. And listening to the conversation on Highway 94, I, I, hope, you know, I hope that there, you know, 10 years from now, that same type of uh, comments can be made because we were the benefit at Fort Carson of a lot of improvement that was done Highway 115 in the past that uh, that we really appreciate. And so. Uh, these reports do turn into action, and uh, and you just got to keep them from collecting dust and keep uh, reviewing them and, and uh, push push the agenda forward. But thank you. We're going to keep wiping the dust off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate all that you. your hard work of years of hard work getting it done. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. We'll, thank we'll you. see you the 19th. All right. Okay. All right. Move on to uh, reports. Then we'll start off from military installation reports. Uh, Colonel Aguilar, you want to start us off, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the board, uh, Kishan Aguilar representing uh, Colonel Todd Moore, the commander at Peterson Air Force Base. So I'll just echo uh, what my colleagues mentioned, and special thanks to Brian Potts and the J. Luce team. Um, it's been a great partnership. We've really appreciated the collaboration. We definitely look forward to the final report. Um, but we are already taking some of the information that's been identified and we're putting it into action. And one of those examples is we have a project that we're about to launch at Cheyenne Mountain Air Force Station to repair NORAD Road. And that repair is going to go the full length up to Cloverleaf, and that is going to include, include excuse me, some uh, stormwater controls. And as Brian just mentioned, that was an item that was identified during the J-Loose. So we're, we're excited about that project. It's going to start early spring. Project is going to take uh, through early fall, not anticipating any major impacts um, to traffic on NORAD Road. Um, the second thing I'd like to do is, um, I talked about it last time, um, but again, we're getting really close to uh, Christmas, and so NORAD Track Santa is a, is a big deal for us at Peterson Air Force Base. I'm very grateful um, for the support from the community. Many, many of you may have seen uh, the commercial that we've launched about it, um, but early morning on Christmas Eve, all the way through, um, we'll have the phones ringing and a great opportunity for our military members and our family members to get an opportunity to uh, spread some holiday cheer. And really, unless there's any questions, that's all I have. But on behalf of uh, Colonel Moore and our mission partners at Peterson, a very Merry Christmas, very happy holidays to, to all of you. So thank you. Uh, Daniel, do you have uh, any addition to that? Or? No? Good. Okay. Ron. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, board members. 
Uh, just uh, first thing I'd like to mention is uh, the president has nominated uh, Colonel Jennifer Grant, our 50th Space Wing commander, for promotion to Brigadier General. Oh. So uh, we look forward to uh, Senate confirmation of that and allowing her to serve at the next level awesome. uh, for our, our, our Air Force and our Department of Defense. One other item that I'd like to mention uh, concerns uh, our Sh Shriver uh, Fire and Emergency Services working with the Ellicott uh, Fire Department. They conducted a training uh, with the, the uh, Shriver and Ellicott Fire Departments on 19 November. It was conducted at Shriver Air Force Base and consisted of uh, mobile uh, su water supply and drafting operations, again, to, to go ahead and exercise our mutual aid response and our capability to work uh, certainly with our partner agencies off the installation. Uh, one additional item where we were working with the community that I'd like to mention is our 50th Security Forces Squadron hosted a site visit with uh, stakeholders from El Paso County Sheriff's Office and Elcott School District on the 3rd of December. They were there to, uh, to look at how we could use Shriver as an Ellicott uh, School District Crisis Response Site. Mm -hmm. So there, uh, all parties agreed that our indoor running track and associated uh, fitness center would serve as an evacuation point for Ellicott schools if that need arose. Uh, certainly our uh, 50th uh, Space Wing Public Affairs would be involved in any kind of uh, reunification notifications and making sure word got out to the public and people if that facility is used. Uh, as a final note on that, uh, April of 2019 was identified as a target month for a 250 plus student exercise. So we look forward to uh, partnering. Many of the, the, the uh, children who live on Shriver attend Ellicott School, so we certainly look, part, uh, look forward to partnering to make sure that we can, uh, we can help out if the situation arises where that, that's needed. And uh, one final note here in uh, emphasizing the, uh, the value and importance of Schriever and the work that we do uh, related to our space capability. Schriever hosted the Air Force Special Operations Command Civic Leader Tour in November. Uh, this involved uh, civic leaders uh, from uh, Air Force uh, Special Operations Command bases around the country. They came to uh, find out uh, what it is that we're doing in Shriver, the importance of the missions we perform are related to this space, and uh, certainly highlighted the work that's going on at Shriver. And with that, if there's no further questions, that's all I've got to present today. Anything else for Shriver? Rod? Uh, Mr. Chair, board members, thank you. Um, real quick, uh, our commanding general, uh, Major General George, is now deployed. Uh, so we do have an acting uh, rear commander, that's uh, General Thigpen, who will be uh, in the community somewhat. So you'll see a new face, uh, or at least in a new title. Uh, General Thigpen's been here for a little bit, so he's already engaged the community. But now he'll be our acting uh, uh, commander while uh, Major General George is deployed. Uh, we did have a brigade that came back over Thanksgiving and enjoy it with the family. And then our third brigade is finalizing their final training. We'll have some block leave over the holidays and then they deploy late January, February. So the deployment cycle still continues to be very active for Fort Carson. But that's all I have uh, unless you have any questions. Thank you. Questions for Rod? Uh, all right, Colonel Bearden, good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. On behalf of General Severia, the uh, commander of your Air Force Academy, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, first, we just wanted to pass along our thanks uh, for the outpouring of support on behalf of uh, uh, Cadet candidate Micah Tice, who went missing on uh, Thanksgiving weekend while hiking. Uh, we still continue to support the Tice family, and we just so appreciate uh, the outpouring of support from the local community during this difficult time. So thank you for that. Um, also, uh, many of you had the opportunity to, uh, to enjoy the Air Force Academy Band's Holly and Ivy concert uh, this past week. Uh, that was another great outpouring of community support, as you may or may not be aware. 25% uh, of the band was gone for that event because they were supporting the state funeral for President Bush. And that was uh, made up by members of the community, uh, which was just really? a fantastic uh, uh, huh. support from the local community. Maybe so we, some enlistments there. Yeah. <laughs> we, so we, we thank you for that. Um, 
on a little bit more of the normal schedule. Uh, so the cadets are in uh, finals this week and uh, winter break starting next week. So uh, we will experience that normal change of uh, rhythm with the winter break coming up next week. And then lastly, um, upcoming events, our National Character and Leadership Symposium is scheduled for 21 and 22 February. Many of the speakers that are confirmed are available if you're interested in those out on the website. Uh, some of the heavier hitting uh, public speakers won't be announced until uh, probably next month, so I hope at our next uh, meeting I can uh, let you know what that lineup looks like. Uh, pending any questions, that's all from uh, your Air Force Academy. Any questions, comments for our guests, military partners? All right, we'll move on then to 8B, the monthly coordinating committee. Uh, who's going to present? Uh, Joe. Okay. 9B, excuse me. Um, Joe Urban. Um, uh, we're in between chairs on the Mobility Coordinating Committee, so I'm reporting. I think you have the report in your packet. Um, we have a full slate of officers on deck for January, the next meeting in January, and we still are seeking uh, appointments from any of the municipalities or counties relative to that committee. So if you know somebody that would be interested in uh, the work that's being done there, please forward their names to us, and we'd be happy to get them involved. All right. Got any questions for on mobility? Nope. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Transportation Advisory Committee, Brian Vitulli, Chair. Good morning, Brian Vitulli, City of Colorado Springs, Mountain Metro Transit, and Chair mm -hmm. of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, the report for our November meeting is in your packet. I don't have anything to add unless there are any, any questions for me. I just appreciate your involvement yesterday. Again, good sure. meeting. I uh, appreciate bringing I, your committee. I wait all this time just to do that. <laughs> it's very exciting. So. You know, we either really, really trust you or really don't have any questions. So, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Brent, all the hard work you do. I, yeah, oh, Stan, go ahead. Yeah, Brian, come back. Oh, Brian, one more. We do have a question for you, Stan. Gotta work. Actually, I just want to say thank you for being so patient so you could get that oh, very sure. succinct report. <laughs> thank you very much. We'll see you next month. All right. <laughs> good. All right, Community Advisory Committee. Is it Michelle or Jim? Jim Moore. Good morning, Jim Moore, uh, first vice chair of the committee. Um, you have the draft report from our meeting on November 28th. I just wanted to uh, bring you up to date uh, that uh, beginning next month, our chair will be Sharon Brown from Fountain. Oh. Our first vice chair will be Tim O'Donnell from Kono. And our second vice chair will be Courtney Stone, who's an at-large member of the committee. Um, that's it. Okay. Uh, I'll accept any questions, or if there are none, that's my report. Okay, any questions for Jim? All right, thank you, Jim. Appreciate thank it. You. Okay, Regional Advisory Committee. Dave, I did see Dave. Yes. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. Uh, you have the uh, report uh, from our last meeting before you. I just want to highlight a couple of things. We uh, said farewell to five members, and we welcomed a new member. And uh, we've also established a new temporary subcommittee. That's one of the highlights that we wanted to point out. Uh, by bylaws, we have two committees, the membership and the TRS, a technical review subcommittee that does the budget-related uh, allocations or recommendations. And the TRS, uh, the subcommittee that we've uh, identified then, uh, is going to be focusing primarily on the four-year plan. To this point, we've had individual members that have looked at the documents and materials coming through and provided inputs, but there hasn't been anything uh, sort of pulled together from the RAC as the RAC position or RAC recommendations and the rest of it. So we're, we believe that the subcommittee, which will have a, a six-month uh, drop dead date, evidently it's just a uh, temporary subcommittee, that during that time we'll look at that four-year plan. That'll be the primary focus. We want to make sure that you're aware of that. Uh, the other thing, uh, a little bit on a local note, is that uh, today, uh, later on this afternoon, the Jackson Creek uh, Senior Living Facility is having its uh, major open house. And it's, uh, it's a major facility for the Tri Lakes area. And I uh, just recommend anybody who would like to uh, participate, it would be great to stop by there. Great. Subject yeah. to any questions, okay. uh, that's all I have. So, Deb, I know you, you hold your meetings around the region, not, not just local here at PPCG. Correct. And uh, if, we, if, if a local entity wanted to host one of those meetings, how would they go about doing that if they wanted to be a, a site oh, for a meeting? Uh, they can contact Joe or myself. Okay. Uh, but typically, we're working with the staff already. And uh, okay. we've been at Park. We've been up at uh, uh, Cripple Creek. We've been up in Monument. So we do move around. And the idea there, again, is just to try to make sure that the community is aware mm -hmm. that there is this regional advisory council that really supports and advocates for the uh, AAA. Great. And thank you for doing that. All right. Good. Thank you. 
Okay, very good. And uh, we'll go on to CDOT monthly update. Is jo yeah, John's still here. Good. Good morning, John. Yeah, I, I, I knew you were in the room anywhere, so go so, ahead. Uh, yeah. Thank you, um, Chairman, Board members, Commissioners, Council members. Appreciate uh, I've had a good week here talking with the City Council on Monday, giving an update on the GAP project. I feel like I'm giving Karen and Mark an excuse not to show up, and then I get to come and give you guys some updates. So I'm going to give you a quick update on a couple of the projects I know of in Region 2, and give you a quick GAP update. And then um, also have some HBT folks because we heard you guys might have some questions awesome. too just about the gap overall and, and express lanes and stuff. So on US 24, uh, Ridge Road improvements are complete, and uh, the Turn Bay and New uh, Turn Bay before Christmas they're looking at for 31st, and uh, new signal poles hopefully in January for installation. On US 24 ITS, that project was awarded for construction and will begin in early 2019. And I've got a note on here that our project team will be talking with El Paso County, particularly, you know, on coordination efforts for that. Um, cable barrier project, the, the earthwork out on I-25 south of uh, Colorado Springs here. Um, earthwork is complete, post-installation, drainage uh, efforts and stuff like that are underway. So mid-January is when they're looking to have completion on that project. Rock Rim and um, bridge preventive maintenance project is on budget on schedule. Um, the split lane configurations are all completed. And they're looking at um, doing some of those concrete repairs. For those of you familiar with uh, on the northbound side as you pass between Garden of the Gods or some, some of that cracked pavement and stuff with the, the half moon shaped cracks and stuff like that, they're going to do, do some pavement replacement on that. And, there, and that's, there's a funding available that looks like actually fully replace those slabs as opposed to try to do a more of a you know, a tie-in CPR type work uh, instead fully replacing those. So on the GAP project, um, as everybody knows, the north segment, the north third of the project is well underway. They're starting to do some of the median walls, um, you know, those center walls where the barrier is going to be and getting some, they're, they're hoping to get some paving in here soon um, if, the, if we can get some decent weather still. But, uh, but they're getting the earthwork, the drainage improvements, all of those types of things done in that phase. We are within, hopefully, days, really, of, of uh, doing the formal letting on the second section of the project, the south section, which is Monument to Greenland. The one thing, and, and I know some of you, especially commissioners in El Paso County, know, is the infra grant. And that's the, that's the thing that we need the most. And it's not, right now, a homework assignment for anybody in this room, but God willing, within the next 48 hours, it will be. Uh, we are just waiting on that final version to come back from Office of Secretary of Transportation and, uh, and, and to get that out and hopefully approved. You know, I know it's a tight timeline, but we're certainly hoping to, to be able to ram everything out and have that, not like notice to proceed, but have the contract, all the paperwork to, to set that up to let the project, if you will, um, done still before Christmas. So that's, that's the goal. We'll, we'll, we'll hope that we can. So El Paso was the applicant for that infra grant. Would you expect that response to come to El Paso or to come to CDOT? Well, yes. Okay. Maybe I already knew the answer. Yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're all, it's a three party instrument. Yeah. We're all going to get okay. it as soon as it comes back in. And, and again, it, it's certainly expected this week and, and hopefully even today, maybe. But okay. Keep an eye on it. Yeah, Mark? You know, I was just going to say, I can tell you from this commissioner's perspective, um, you know, I look forward to uh, supporting and approving that uh, moving forward, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Commissioner. Okay. Um, so I, I think right now we're just up for questions and all for, for myself and, like I said, our HPT um, reps are here with me to help. Yeah, and so questions for, uh, for CDOT, current projects or outlooks. We do have, thank you for bringing the folks, maybe introduce your guests from uh, High Performance Transportation. So I'm Nick Farber. I'm the head of Innovative Project Delivery with uh, High Performance Transportation Enterprise at CDOT. Um, and I brought Kelly Brown home with me today. She's our towing operations manager. So if, uh, we're happy to answer any questions you guys might have about how the toll lanes, the, the managed lanes are going to work on the GAP project. So um, Maybe you could just questions. give us an introduction of how, how you see it opening and uh, time frame and process and then we'll yeah, sure. follow this with questions. So the project will, the traffic and revenue study shows the project opening on January 1st, 2022. It'll be around that time uh, frame. Um, so it'll have two toll zones. Um, I think it's like a dollar ten and a dollar twenty, 
a dollar fifteen for the other zone. It's to encourage uh, throughput trips along the corridor instead of the, the weaving like you have on US 36, which is a toll point between every exit. So it'll be two toll zones. It'll be two dollars and twenty-five cents. At least the traffic and revenue study shows right now it'll be two dollars and twenty-five cents for the entire trip along the corridor. Um, that is about equates to about fifteen cents a mile, which is the lowest per rate toll mile in uh, Colorado so far. Um, for instance, on C470, it's uh, going to be thirty-three cents a mile. Um, so for twelve miles, it'll be between four and six dollars on C470. Uh, down here, it'll be two two dollars and twenty-five cents. Um, as the project gets closer to opening, we will analyze that to see if um, it stays the same or we go up a little bit. I can't imagine it goes up a little bit. But we did a really in-depth study. We talked to a lot of people. Uh, we did a, um, a state of preference survey that um, equated people's value of time that then goes into how much we should actually charge for a toll. So um, happy to any, answer any other questions you guys might have. So, so one of the factors that might increase is if you suppose that it doesn't have any effect that the that the the, the uh, express lane has exact same traffic as a general purpose lane people because the toll is low and we don't actually get any reliability gain uh, uh, what, what would we'll, happen then we will raise the toll price okay okay yes yeah. you want to you want to have it said it that then you know FHWA uh, regulations say that we have to at least maintain a speed of 45 miles an hour that's the the floor. We try to maintain a 55 mile an hour minimum speed in that lane. Um, so we, uh, that's why we are, if, if we're seeing congestion in that lane and speeds are continually dropping below 45 miles an hour, FHW is going to come to us and say, you have to do something. Um, so that, that something is raising toll prices to, to keep people, to just kind of encourage people to either use it or stay out. So okay. and actually have a reliable trip. Okay. Questions are on the table. Stan? <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, knowing that you're at HPTE and, you know, that's about innovation on, you know, transportation infrastructure and so forth, one of the things that I have, um, you know, been working on, at least just, you know, personally, and I think it might be an important thing, and I'm kind of interested in knowing if HPTE might be willing to take something like this on, and that is trying to get people to do more about carpooling. And I did discuss this at our meeting yesterday along the lines of using smartphone technology, there's opportunities now for people to find neighbors in the same neighborhood and they pick each other up, right, on a way going north or going south, drive through the gap, go to Denver, but then they're all working in the same general area, like maybe the tech center or downtown or something like that. So using the kinds of smartphone technologies that are out there, there may be ways for people to kind of self-actualize carpools where it's easier to go from door to door. And I know that there are a couple of um, software models that are out there, some of which I think are better than others. I've kind of been trying to figure out what might be those good choices. But I don't know if you do any of that kind of research in HPTE, which is can help citizens um, kind of self-organize to get into carpools and van pools on their own. Because if you can, and uh, that, that might actually be a great way to kind of reduce the uh, number of vehicles driving through that gap and kind of help us all. Yes, that's a tool that I'm familiar with, and I am researching it, and I, I do plan to try to implement that not just on the gap corridor but other carpool corridors so that even though you may not know the person, you do work in the same general area and you do still live in the same general area. So there are tools out there. Yeah, it's kind of like the modern version of the Washington, D.C. slug line, <laughs> using the smartphones, if yeah. you will. Yeah, thank you. And we, all Kelly's going to talk about our transponders, <coughs> our transponders as well, so our switchable yes. transponders. Yeah, we are going to have um, switchable transponders that are available so that on the days that you're carpooling, you slide it into HOV mode and you will not be charged the toll. On the day you're just a single occupant or one other person in the car, you can slide it over to toll mode and you're, you'll be charged the toll for that trip. So there's a lot of different kinds of technologies that I'm personally interested in investigating and implementing if possible. Okay. Kind of around the corner then. Well, I'd, oh, like go ahead, go ahead, I'd like to also say, I've mentioned before and you guys have asked before about the TDM efforts we're doing in traffic demand management. 
um, stuff we're doing. So I, I probably I might get you in contact with our Dr. Cog uh, representative Celeste, and I'm drawing a blank on her last name right now, Commissioner. Though if you'd like, I can I can tie you in because that's exactly I shouldn't say exactly. In concept, that's similar to what she is trying to do um, with their way to go programs. Um, I, you know, they have are you know at least talking with the M Mountain Metro Transit guys. You know, linking in those systems, and they're trying to put together kind of a website interface where people can, hey, I'm interested in carpooling, and 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 can build from the ground up, grassroots kind of th those types of things. It it's focused on actually the. Um, way to go program that Dr. Cog actually helps you get in, get you in a van as well, but it certainly isn't limited to that. Yeah, I appreciate uh, maybe uh, helping to make that contact because after that meeting yesterday, uh, some of your reps were talking about the fact that Dr. Cog is either adopted or is close to adopting, you know, making recommendations on some of these uh, smartphone apps that can be beneficial. And so it, I think they've, they've got some progress in Dr. Cog on some of these concepts and ideas. So I'd be interested in learning more because they kind of said that Dr. Cog had adopted them already, and I'm not sure we've had a discussion about them down here yet. Okay. Just around the table. I'm going to go oh, around the peg and then Mark. So I think Andy, did you have a comment? No. no. Okay, Mark. Yeah, I, I thought originally dynamic tolling was going to be the order of the day on this stretch of road. What happened to that idea? We are in the process of procuring dynamic tolling equipment. Um, not sure whether we'll have it in time to start the gap with that equipment. But it is going to be a tool in our toolbox that we will have available within a few years. We are just beginning the RFP process on that. Okay, okay. Neil? Is, is it worth explaining? I mean, being very clear about uh, the dynamic means you have a sensor array of systems where it's an algorithm and it's it's real time kind of automated um, adjusting of tolls up and down, right? As opposed to then there is there is kind of a man well there's also kind of a manual method of that to, to where, where if you could really like in the mountain corridor, oh, right? That's in the mountain on the mountain express lane right now. We have a range between three and thirty dollars. The the toll price averages uh, between five and seven dollars right now. But that's manually set by someone at the CTNC in Golden who just watches traffic volumes as they're coming down. As those traffic volumes increase, they just manually increase the price. And since it's recreational, it works that way. On this we, corridor, it would not. But I, and, and I'm just trying to lay the different thing. And then there is what we the time of day, which is what we're going to be implementing. Yeah. Start. I, I, I just I think if that is going to end up being the order of the day, you need to be really careful about talking about. The toll being two dollars and twenty-five cents. Um, I, you know, I think one of the issues that we've had, you know, is been that that a lot of um, a lot of citizens of El Paso County feel like they've been told one thing and then had something else happen, and so there have been some credibility issues. Um, you know, m maybe earned, maybe not. Uh, and so I, I think when you're talking about the toll, I, you, you know, you're going to say it's going to be two dollars and twenty-five cents, and if that lasts for six months. It, you can have huge issues moving forward. Huge issues moving forward if it, you know, goes up to five bucks during uh, peak traffic time. So just be careful about that stuff. If I, okay. right now, if, if that were to happen, it would have we'd have to we'd set a, a ceiling price on toll rates that would work with the dynamic pricing algorithm, so it wouldn't go over a certain price. Um, right now, I would say that price that ceiling would be two dollars and twenty five cents. Okay. Um, but as we get closer, if we ever, if, when we get to dynamic pricing, the board, the HPT board, would approve the, the, how the algorithm works, the, the ceiling for the, the toll rate, and that would be heavily communicated to the public. Um, so, all right, I, I think it's important. I mean, you're right. I, a point that I think I have made at every public meeting, though, is is you, you, the user, will decide, and if if by chance. People in El Paso County all actually love it a lot more and want to get in it in, in large, large numbers. Then yes, there, there certainly is. it is. It is a user-defined system in the end. Okay, okay. Uh, Neil, and then Andy, please. Yeah, quickly. Um, I think I know the answer, but um, you're going to phase the construction. Does that mean you're going to phase the opening, or no. it's going to all open at once? For, 
there certainly are, could be some opportunities to open up, for example, the, the north stretch that we've started work on already um, and, and have three lanes open in, in that stretch, basically between Toma and Castle Rock. Because this is, is such, there's so many bridge structures and so much, um, you know, just asphalt pavement that needs to go down, um, we really, even though we phased the starting of the project over a year, I mean, it, you know, that means that that conclusion is really going to be phased into less than a year or two. We really expect all the final paving, top lift to be um, summer 2021. And so it, there's, there's going to be minimal opportunities to just, A, open up, except probably that north stretch. Thank you. Okay. Eddie? I'm biting my tongue a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, I just want to register one, one comment here. At the stack meeting two times ago now, um, we had a whole big presentation, draft presentation on the policy of managed lanes. And we're talking about managed lanes up in here. But they had, I think, 18 different measures, and tolling was only one of them. Um, and so I'm going to continue to register the complaint that, and, and you guys are just in execution. You're not the policy and you're not making the decision. But um, so I'm tempering my comments. But I really don't think that you ought to be walking down this lane too much, and especially what triggered me to talk about this is the same comment about dynamic tolling. Um, be very, very careful about that if you implement that because, you know, I've, I drove through California and saw dynamic tolling in practice. You know, as you're driving along and you watch the, the numbers change while you're driving, um, that's not going to go over very well, to say the least. So, word to the wise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just for clarification, just so it's, it's on the record one more time, just where does the corridor begin specifically and where does it end? Well, if you mean the express lane facilities yes. themselves. Correct. Um, I mean, we are widening, starting in Monument, right now where, where Monument um, pinches down or, or in the southbound direction widens out, right, right there about okay. the way station. Okay. Okay. Up the hill, there's not going to be any express lane elements. That's going to be just a general, you know, we're widening out the three lanes in each direction and really even a fourth lane because we are going to continue to have that acceleration lane, truck climbing lane coming out of the way station on northbound. Mm -hmm. So once you get past the county line exit on the north side, if, if you're going northbound, mm -hmm. and so southbound mirrors it, right, everything I'm about to say. As you go past the county line exit, that's where the express lanes will begin, so that we can capture, you know, the, the so we don't cause problems on that uphill climb, and so that we, you know, have the maximum ability for people to enter who want to use the express lane. And then that's going to continue all the way to um, just just south. Um, I think it's about two miles south of the um, well, basically right where the concrete pavement and or begins now on the south side of Castle Rock. That's where okay. the express lanes will end and right where it, it opens back up to Okay. Three so, and I, I can be um, facetious and say, so the, this is going to be the, to the tolling lane is going to be the, the fourth lane, right, <laughs> of, between El Paso County and Castle Rock. So as you look at restriping, possibly looking at um, maybe minimizing some of the um, uh, side areas that you have, you know, we need we need another six feet on each side to make it a fourth lane as we restrive. So that would be my goal and desire. And I just want to really echo again what Commissioner Waller said. You know, the people of this county, have, um, there's a perceived perception that they, they've mis been misled once. And if you guys are going to say 225 and then try to do dyna dynamic tolling down there, you, your message needs to be immediately, we're going to do dynamic tolling eventually. So just know that it's going to be five or six dollars potentially someday to, to drive up there. Don't don't mislead them again. So, thanks. Any other questions around the table? Yes, Rocky Scott, oh, member well, of the HPTE board. Yeah, a few quick points. Uh, one is Nick's a humble guy, but but he is being invited to national and international conferences to speak on this topic. So we're fortunate in the state of Colorado to have somebody who really knows what he's talking about, and. Um, and you're also very, you're very brief, which is interesting for a guy who does what you do. But <coughs> it's, 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 it's extremely complicated. On the tolling, tolling question, it's important with my HBTE hat on to, to, th to offer two observations. One of them is I completely agree on the communications thing. We have to be very careful about it. 
The, the principal objective of, of the managed lanes is trip reliability, time reliability. They can't tell you today what that number is. And I think every time I've heard this presented, they've said, today, this, in fact, Nick said it today. He said, the number right now looks like X, but it, depending on how things turn out, it could be different. So uh, I think what we're hearing is um, maybe we don't, Maybe we offer a range and say, but it's, and you're already doing this, I know, but we need to, I think, think about the communications a little bit more to make sure that nobody, that's impossible, to try to minimize the probability somebody walks away saying, I was told two and a quarter. Because in reality, I think if you listen to all these tapes, nobody's ever said it will be two and a quarter forever, or five minutes, or ten minutes. It said the numbers that we are seeing today suggest two and a quarter. But... The fact that we're still hearing this is somehow we need to change that a little bit. The third point that I think is important is um, John's a very optimistic guy. One of the things we have to remember, going back to Mark's question earlier, is we have a new legislature and a new governor. Senate Bill 267 is a major source of the funding for the gap. All kinds of things can happen with 267. I mean, it, it, no legislature can commit a future legislature. Uh, I'm not suggesting this is going to happen, but... The, the new legislature has the ability to, to wipe out 267 and say we have something better. Senate Bill 1, remember, is going to give us another election this coming fall, um, at which if it passes, 267 goes away. Um, the, the ability to, to, to issue the COPs that fund uh, the 267 project for year two um, it is still somewhat in question because of the of this Senate Bill 1 thing in the fall. So I, I guess all I'm saying is, and John's a very optimistic guy, and he, he thinks we're going to figure it out. I'll tell you, I think we're going to figure it out, but, that, but please don't walk away from this meeting like the two and a quarter number, thinking that all of this is guaranteed and it's all going to be in place by the end of 2021, because there are hitches that could come up along the way. The questions for our CDOT friends. Thank you so much for coming down. I appreciate the trip down through the gap uh, to get here this morning. Uh, thanks for all the hard work to get it done. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Uh, we'll move on then to Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee stack update. Uh, I had a conflict this month. I did not attend, and I think Andy took the lead. Uh, um, I'll take a step um, about it. Uh, lengthy discussion about their underfunded um, rest area program um, and what kind of message that sends to visitors coming into, into Colorado. Um, it, maybe one of the highlights was uh, Mike Lewis did mention that um, he threw his name in the hat for consideration to continue to be the executive director of CDOT and um, it wasn't quite a eulogy, but we all said really good words about uh, the, the message and the tone and the work that Mike and his staff have done at CDOT and uh, wish him well in that regard. So hopefully there'll be a decision fairly soon. But um, that was pretty much it as far as stack takeaways. Anything else? No. no? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Executive Director's report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of things uh, with your indulgence, about five things I wanted to report on. Um, first of all, our offices here at PPACG will be closed this Friday afternoon, uh, the 14th, in case you're looking to do business with any of us. You can reach me, reach a number of us, but um, the office itself is going to be closed for our annual holiday luncheon and event with our staff and, and our volunteers. Um, next item, I wanted to mention and express kudos to our uh, AAA Medicare counselors and uh, case managers, our open enrollment period for Medicare closed uh, Friday um, this past week, and we had much higher numbers than we've had over the past two years. I think it matched what we had about three years ago, but had a chance to sit in with a number of the uh, case managers as they offered um, client consultations. They call them clients, but they're your residents that you serve across the whole region, and was really, really impressed with um, their dedication, their knowledge, their professionalism, and really the trust that they're building with so many residents across the region. We get a lot of repeat customers, a lot of repeat clients, and that's, be that's because they've built that relationship with our case managers, but really impressed with the work they do and having to come up with answers off the top of their heads with really complicated Medicare options. But uh, they did a fantastic job and really pretty high numbers this past year. 
Um, one thing I wanted to mention, um, Joe did the Mobility Coordinating Committee report, but one thing that's maybe in the memo that, that we didn't mention, we had a really nice um, driver recognition event this past month. And if you got the newsletter that we send out that Jessica sends out each month for PPACG activities, on the back page it has a picture of a bunch of different drivers that were recognized for their dedication and the service that they provide, um, and a number of drivers from community inter intersections, uh, Teller Senior Coalition, uh, City of Fountain, Fountain Valley Senior Center were recognized in a really nice event. And um, a lot of them said really great words about why they do what they do and just really appreciate bringing uh, humanity to their work. That, that's one thing that really, really came across. Uh, one additional note I wanted to mention, um, we've got a couple of openings right now at PPACG. Um, our AAA program development position is currently open, closes um, the 17th of next week. That's the position formerly occupied by Carrie Schillinger um, and looking at uh, getting that filled hopefully in the, the new year. Since your last board meeting, we've had um, two resignations, two staff members moved on. One was a GIS professional, another one was a transportation planner. So we're, we're going to be looking to fill those two positions. I think I mentioned at your last meeting that um, that Ken Prather announced his res um, retirement as well. He's going to be re retiring in early 2019. Um, he'll be around here for a couple more months, but um, we're going to go ahead and start advertising for his position as well, so we have some overlap. But we're going to re kind of recast his position a little bit, and you'll see that advertised as an innovation and technology lead, a position that would really manage our GIS and modeling resources here within PPACG. So we're going to go out th those three uh, announcements here in the next week or two. Um, so if you know anybody looking for work in transportation, GIS, modeling, um, se send them our way. Uh, just two more things. Um, second to last, we just found out last week that uh, we, were, we were awarded $50,000 from DOLA for our DOLA mini grants that we administer each year for our local jurisdictions. And we put in for um, three jurisdictions in particular that we would help out with planning, GIS, and uh, design assistance. Uh, Town of Victor. Town of Fair Play and Green Mountain Falls. We're going to help out in a variety of different ways um, in 2019. So really pleased to get that um, to get that award. And then finally, just want to mention that um, this is something that uh, Commissioner Vanderwerf and I discussed. We had a request from Tom Viersba with uh, NEPCO, the Northern El Paso uh, Coalition, to get a formal position with on the PPACG CAC. And mm -hmm. came in, I think, about a month or so ago. He's expressed interest in having kind of a standing um, uh, appointment on, on the CAC. I know there's a couple of vacancies right now or that will be coming up in the next couple of months, one at large and one in El Paso County um, position. But he kind of made the plea that since Kono's got a, a seat at the table, NEPCO represents, I think, about 20,000 residents in the county. Um, and although we have a representative from Monument and other parts of El Paso County. He felt that their body as a whole really isn't represented and uh, wanted to make a pitch. One suggestion that we talked about was maybe um, we asked Mr. Viersbo to come to one of your um, future board meetings, maybe in January, make the pitch and see you've got a couple of different options, maybe either fill it with the county position that you have open or consider amending the CAC bylaws to have a specific standing uh, position for NEPCO on the CAC. But maybe we have Mr. Viersbo come uh, next month or so and um, make the pitch and then go from there. Okay. So I just wanted to put that yeah. out there. I'd be interested to hear what the chair of the CAC uh, uh, has to say about that as well. And, and, I, and Jim and I haven't had a chance to talk about it, so he's got a puzzled look on his face, mm -hmm. but um, we could talk <laughs> offline. And maybe it is something that you also refer back yeah. to the CAC and get their feedback, their uh, recommendation on, on that as well. Okay. Yep. Great. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll move on into member entity announcement. Let me just say I, I just learned that uh, uh, Commissioner Mark Waller will will uh, be stepping down from the PPACG. We'll dedicate his time now to the PPRTA, another uh, companion board uh, in, in the El Paso area. So uh, today is uh, Mark's last time yeah. on the board. Uh, we'll make an arrangements for appropriate recognition at a future date. But uh, Mark, thank you for your service Thanks. to the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Yeah, but barring any sort of unforeseen circumstance, yeah, this will probably be my last meeting. It's been my Pleasure to serve on this. You know, I kind of got the uh, legislative affairs thing up and running a couple of years ago, and I've you know been happy to uh, get to be a part of that and uh, you know, help kind of drive policy for the region. And I've told Norm that uh, you know to the degree that you all still want me to participate in the legislative stuff, I'll be happy to help out with that in any way that I can. But uh, I just I think I'm not going to have the capacity to be able to serve on the board moving forward. So thanks. It's been a pleasure. Well, let's...
So, member, any announcements? You have a when we're on this table on entity announcements. Thanks. He still has a lot of years left as a commissioner. So he does. Might not be his last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> back that's, here. That's right. So say goodbye for this next year, but I think you'll be back. So I um, wanted to say that I'm um, honored going to get to do Track Santa and open it at 6 to 8, 6 to 8 a.m. on the 24th. It'll be tons of fun talking to kids. Um, I've enjoyed doing that over the years. Again, it was an honor to serve here. Thank you for the privilege. Um, I'm, I'm humbled at your graciousness and wanted to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Around the table, Stan. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. And uh, I know it's kind of uh, kind of the beginning of the discussion f for uh, NEPCO's participation uh, in some of the subboards of this organization. But I do support that. They're uh, they're a strong organization in the uh, monument area. I think they would be a, a great contributor to the conversation that goes on down here. So hopefully we can continue that conversation and eventually get to a place where they will have a seat at, uh, at the CAC. Thank you. Okay. Dick? No? Terry? Just kind of over on the table. Rocky, any closing thoughts? Okay. Ken? Member and enemy, member entity announcements. I guess most of you know that since the last meeting, um, we were able to successfully conclude our negotiations with the COG Railway. Um, we expect them to start uh, rebuilding shortly. Um, it's going to take a couple years-ish, so they will be not open probably till spring of 2021. But we're delighted to finally put that part of it behind us and move on to helping them rebuild. Okay. Great. Don? No. Jill? Mandy? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. It's uh, 1120. Uh, I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday.